that's how we get started. I've got uh, about 90 people sitting uh, sitting online. So uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining this first uh, Lucidity Masterclass session. Uh, my name's Alex. Today, I'm joined by Maddie um, from our marketing team and Dan from Implementation. Um, for those of you who know Dan, you'll know you're in, in good hands. He takes us through some examples how to use the Inform module um, across the business. We've put together some sort of key examples and uh, and situations that we've seen from uh, from you guys, from clients, and uh, and sort of in in our experience working with this system. Um, we'll be breaking the session down into three main parts. First off, we're going to look at the experience of submitting a form through the mobile app. Generally, this is where most of your staff and your, your workforce are going to be interacting with the system, submitting data in through the mobile. So we'll take you through some, some examples there. The second portion is going to be a, a demonstration of sort of the life cycle of what happens afterwards. So once these forms are submitted in, where do they go within the system? How can you um, review the data that's, that's put through? What kind of workflows are attached and the reporting? And then we'll also touch on uh, have some of the administration. So how these parts of the system are put together, how these forms are designed and built, um, and a, a bit of a touch on some uh, some new functionality relating to comments. Um, and then the last section will be a Q and A. So any questions that uh, that you submit throughout the uh, the first two parts, we'll then pull together and, and sort of answer some of those. Um, which is probably a good note. You should see a Q and A section in Teams. Um, so please feel free throughout the session to ask any questions there. We'll uh, either just respond directly in the chat or we'll sort of pull them together to address at sort of that final portion of the meeting. Um, this session is going to be recorded, so we'll send it out to everybody later in the week. Um, you can share it around to uh, anybody who wasn't able to attend. Um, and if there are any questions that we don't get to in, in the time today, we'll, um, we'll make sure that we send out some information about those as well. Um, I'm going to hand over to Maddie to get started with the first section. We've uh, we've cheated a little bit and just pre-recorded uh, about an eight or nine minute um, demo on the mobile, just so we don't have sort of the hassle of switching between mobile and the browser. But um, we'll be back with you live afterwards to go through uh, the the life cycle of the forms and and then address the Q and A. So take it away, Maddie. Thanks, guys. We'll most commonly be interacting with the mobile app, meeting forms in the field. So we're going to start with the mobile app. For demonstration purposes today, we've created a single form template with a number of different examples to demonstrate key functionality. Our user will select the form they want to complete and be taken to the form admin screen. The fields here will pre-populate based on the user's home organizational unit. So now we're going to complete the form. For clients subscribed to the asset module, we offer integration between the inform and asset modules. This integration allows us to tag form records against an asset to both file a copy of the form record in the asset module and also to record usage for an asset as part of the form. So now we're going to go ahead and add the odometer reading for our vehicle to the pre-start form. Adding this usage reading will allow us to trigger maintenance requirements based on the asset usage. We're now going to complete our vehicle pre-start inspection. Our first question is a pass, but our second question has failed. Here we can see conditional display logic prompting our user to add a photo, action or comment because the question has been marked as failed. By pressing photo, we can upload a photo from our device's camera roll or use the inbuilt camera to take a new photo. Pressing action will allow us to create a corrective action for this question. We're going to assign this action to Jane. We're also going to let Jane know what action they need to take and when they need to complete this action by.
in comment will allow us to record one or more short comments to the question as part of the inspection or corrective actions process. You may be familiar with the old way of recording comments by conditionally displaying a paragraph field and using that to capture the comment. However, that was limited to a single paragraph to recording the ongoing log of notes in a, and recording those log of notes in a consistent manager, manner could be challenging. Conditional comments can be linked to many different field types. In our inspection checklist example here, We've added the question based on the selected response for our radio button. But we can also conditionally display inline comments based on checkboxes by selecting one or more responses. In our example here, both windy and rainy. We can also display the comment based on the number provided in a number field. In this case, because our number is less than four. In this example, we're taking a look at how to manage the swims process in Lucidity. Our recommended approach is to use a library of predefined template swims. Here, our swims have been linked to a government website, but these swims can also be uploaded to the intranet filing cabinet or stored in your own cloud infrastructure and then linked to the inform template. Once you've selected the applicable swims type, you can click on the embedded link to review the swims template and understand the particulars of this job. From here, we can now add any additional job steps, hazards, and risk mitigations. These are being listed using a table element. On the mobile app, table columns are displayed vertically due to the smaller screen real estate. However, when viewed through the desktop web browser, these comments will be displayed across the screen like table columns. We can also use our swims form to enable workers to sign on using another table element. Here, I'm signing onto the swims. The date and time have been automatically populated based on the current date and time. And now I can sign on the screen. If you'd rather not pass a mobile device around a team of people to sign onto the swims, you can even take a selfie of the whole team and just list everyone's names. Approval workflows are used where responsibility for a form record needs to change between different users. For example, an application for leave, a timesheet, or even a new onboarding 
uh, form for employees. These approval workflows can be static, meaning each time the form is submitted, the same approval workflow applies. In this case, the approval by the line manager to the uh, in the first instance, and then uh, progressing the form to the payroll manager. As we can see here, if I'm the selected approver, I can sign on the screen to complete my section of this form. But if I'm not the selected approver, as is the case with the payroll team, I'm not able to sign. The approval workflow can also be dynamically set using conditional display functionality, as in this example where we want the line manager to approve all forms, but the second line manager is a different person, depending on if the selected division is division A or division B. Rightio, so we've uh, taken a look at how that all looks through the mobile app now. Um, so let's take a look at what this is gonna look like for you back in the office. So here's a few um, examples we've prepared a little bit earlier uh, for today. Uh, to start, we're looking here at the list of forms within the inform module. So these are all of the existing form records. Now, depending on the type of information you're trying to extract from uh, the inform module and how you're wanting to report, you can look at your form records as an aggregated list view, which is uh, by clicking here on the list all button. And this will show you all of your forms across all the different form templates. Or if you're wanting to pull out the specific information from the form, such as the custom fields you've added to a form template, you can click through the form group and select the particular form you're wanting to report on. And as we can see here, we've got the example of our employee onboarding and personal details form. This approach does allow us to add the custom fields from within the form template into the column configuration. However, from the list all view, because we are aggregating data across multiple form templates, the fields that are available within this view are only going to be uh, the inform metadata. That is those consistent fields that are available from the form detail section at the very top of each record. Now let's take a look at the form that we've just submitted here. So here we've got our form record. As I mentioned, we've got our top detail section here being the standard form fields for every form record. And these are the fields that will be available from that list all view. But when we scroll down a bit further, we can see now uh, the information that was pertaining to that asset integration. So where we selected which asset that form record should be tagged to. And when we take a look at the, at the asset here, we've also optionally enabled some additional fields from within that uh, admin, uh, from within the assets admin record uh, in order to display as a read only field. This is very useful as a way to verify that the selected asset is the correct asset that you're looking at, whether you're referencing to an asset ID uh, or even to registration serial numbers. Uh, you can also add additional text fields here, such as the additional information box from an asset to be able to prompt for uh, any ongoing information for an asset, such as an outstanding, uh, outstanding defect or a specific issue to be addressed on that one asset. We can also see the usage reading that was uploaded by our user as part of the mobile app here. Um, so this usage reading uh, will allow us to schedule our maintenance based on a based on an ongoing uh, usage based pattern here. So in this case by kilometres, the unit of measure you use doesn't really matter within uh, within this context because we are just uh, storing a decimal number. Whether you're storing that as a or whether you're reading that sorry as kilometres, hours, trips, or what have you. So now we're going to take a look at our additional questions that we've uh, built into the form. Now you'll notice here that the layout is slightly different to what you're looking at on the mobile app. And that's because we are trying to make use of more of the screen real estate uh, on the wider screen of a computer here. So where we were selecting our passes and our fails as radio uh, buttons on the, uh, on the mobile app, we can see here uh, that those are represented. We can also see the specific questions uh, that had corrective actions raised. So in this case, the failure of the seat belt, and we can see here uh, the uh, attached the attached uh, image at the top. And the benefit of having that here means that we don't have to try and cross-reference 
um, from a larger list of photographs at the very bottom of the form to identify uh, which question that, uh, that verification or that attachment actually links to. Now, in this case, we want to uh, assign a corrective action as part of this process. And the great part about using Inform is it's not a it's not a single entry and then nothing further happens with the form. This is going to be an ongoing process uh, and a way to manage manage this particular form on an ongoing basis. So as a manager here, I'm just going to add a corrective action to this question as well. We're going to assign it to somebody. And we're going to set when we want this completed by. And this will default to open. If I was uh, recording historic corrective actions for auditing purposes, I could also set this to closed immediately, meaning that no action actually has to be created, um, but I'm just recording it for, uh, ongoing, uh, for ongoing purposes. Now this action won't be sent out to anybody until I save this form. So in this way, you are able to go through and finish working on the, uh, on the form record. And then once you hit save, everything will be uploaded and emailed out. We can also take a look now at our, um, uh, at our conditional display functionality, especially as it uh, links into our new inline comments feature. So this is a feature that was added into the system um, probably a few months ago now. Uh, and this allows us to add an ongoing running comment to uh, any questions within the system. So depending on the type of question, there may or may not be conditional display logic that can be applied. So in our example, we've added, uh, we've added three fields here that do support conditional display logic. So we've got our radio buttons where you're able to select one of the one or more of the responses to be uh, to trigger the comment here. So if I was to click on pass, which doesn't trigger a comment, as we can see, we no, we no longer see the, the comment button. With our checkboxes, we've got an additional option here to select uh, either one of any of the responses or pick multiple responses, meaning we need to have everything selected. So in our example, we actually set this up to uh, only display if the checkboxes were rainy and windy. So if I deselect rainy, we lose our comment field there. Likewise, with our, uh, with our number field here, this was to set for four or under. So if I change the score here, it's going to hide our comment field. When we're adding comments in, we're just going to provide a short statement for the comment. And we're going to save. And the system will automatically log the date that this was recorded. Now, if um, I was logged into the correct user account, I've just noticed I'm not, this would also have displayed my full name, um, but this particular user account doesn't have a name uh, in the system. We've also got our swims that we designed before as well. So as you can see, we're using our drop down menu here to conditionally display the type of swims that are being uh, listed here. Now there are many different ways to approach um, designing swims templates within Lucidity. Our recommended approach here is to create a library of standardized templates that you draw from, and then you're using the Inform module as a way to distribute those templates to identify any gaps and um, uh, gaps in the job step. And we're also using the Inform module then to sign on to that SWIMS as well for, um, for, a, uh, for a reference point. As we mentioned in the video, these links can link to any source whether they are, in this case, a government website, documents stored in your own intranet module, uh, within the intranet module, sorry, or else documents stored on your own cloud infrastructure. So with, when we look at our tables here, um, we can see here that we've already added in one row for our, for our job steps. If we needed to make any changes at this point through the web portal, we can do that as well. Adding a row or adding a job step is as simple as uh, clicking on the add button and we can remove rows by clicking on the minus button and removing our row. As we mentioned, we've also got all of our worker sign-ons and these dates and times will pre-populate based on the date and time that the row was. 
So if I go ahead and create a new worker sign on now, we can see that the date and the time are updated because uh, they are now the current date and time. So we've got our multi-step approvals. So as we can see, administrator has signed our line manager section here uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, but now we want to get the next step of the approval. Now, because I am signed in as payroll, I'm able to now sign my payroll section to complete, my, to complete this portion of the form. But if we look at the next example here, because I am not listed as, I'm not um, logged in as the ICT team, I won't be able to sign the Division B line manager example here. So we've gone through and we've created our, our forms, we've uploaded our form records. Down the bottom, we do have the ability to also upload additional, uh, far, additional attachments and list additional actions as an as a, um, ongoing process here. Now, the inline attachments are strictly for photographs. However, if you have any other uh, documentation that you need uh, to support this form, you can also upload the file. There is a large list of the supported file types available within our, um, available within our help centre. Um, but in short, any of the common file types you would expect environment as well as a few uh, uh, more edge case file types are supported and we'll uh, circulate we'll circulate a link to that list of documents uh, after the meeting so once we've created our forms what then how do we take a look at uh, what our form what forms have been completed for our assets and what does this actually drive so we're going to take a look now at our excavator within the asset module and we can see here a full list of all of the form records uh, that were created for this asset uh, with our form that we were just looking at there at the top of the list. If we've got the correct privileges to open form records within the inform module, we can actually open up the form record by clicking on the open button or really anywhere on the row and that'll open up the form record for us in a new tab. In this way, the asset module becomes that single source of truth for all things asset related um, because you're able to not only look at the um, maintenance and uh, history of the asset, you can also look at all of the forms that have been tagged against that asset. But you may be wondering to yourself, if we go back to our form template here for a minute, what does our usage actually drive? So if we take a look at our asset maintenance register here, we can see here what our um, maintenance schedule is. Now we've pre-designed this a little bit earlier and we can see that our asset usage is due at 20,000 kilometres, uh, which is not close to the, um, to the 15,000 kilometres current usage reading. So each time a form is submitted uh, with a new usage reading, that updates the assets usage and in turn uh, will help us know how close we are to requiring maintenance. Uh, we'll go into more detail about how to set up maintenance schedules and what have you um, in a future video, uh, but that's, that's that starting point. But how do we put all of this together? So here we've popped into our form admin view and we're taking a look at the design of our particular form. So we saw at the beginning how, the, how we could uh, list a set of corrective actions being your supporting photos, a mandatory action and an inline comment as part of a part of a um, pass fail not applicable or part of a question. But what do we do to actually build that? So what we're going to do is we're going to add in our question. So in this case, I'm going to select a radio button and because I am wanting to place it in a particular place on the form, I can click and drag my radio button onto the screen and it might be hard to see through a screen share, but there is a little faint grey line which is telling me where that uh, radio button field is going to be dropped. And in that way, it means you don't have to uh, drop the field to the bottom, which will be what happens when you click a button and then drag it back up again. It's just a little bit more efficient for you. So we're going to name our field and we're going to add in our, um, our pass fail not applicable. And because we want to display this question across the screen, we're going to change our number of options per row to three just to use up a bit more of that uh, screen real estate. And now we want to add in our corrective actions for this question. So we're going to go back to add new field 
And directly underneath question three, we're going to just drag in this case an info box. Now, if we were just doing um, uh, inline comments, we wouldn't even need the, the info box there because we would be able to add the inline comments directly to the question by ticking here on add comment. And then we could set which field we want, to, uh, which response, sorry, we want them on based on the conditional checkbox here to select pass fail not applicable or else if there's nothing being selected. Um, but in this case, because we want to add corrective actions and uh, photos as well, we're going to put this in as a info box field. So we're going to enable our inline elements here. So we want to uh, make photos available. For our action, we want to make it required. And then for our comment, we just want to make it available as well. But to make this conditional on question three, we're going to scroll down to the bottom and from conditionally display, we're going to select our question that we want to check. So question three. And we're going to select which response or response says that we want this to display on. And in this case, we just want it to, to display for fail. And there we have our, um, our conditional display functionality has been set up with inline elements. Now, the other thing we'll take a look at here is if I scroll down to um, where we've got our inline comments set up, we'll take a look at how the conditional display logic for inline comments works as well. So here we've got those three examples we looked at before being the radio buttons, checkboxes and number fields. So for our radio button here, we've already enabled and required a comment and we've said that this is going to be conditional based on its responses. And we only want the comment in this case uh, to, be, uh, to be when the fail has been selected. Now in this case, uh, because radio buttons are a one response only selection, while we can tick more responses, it will always be an or argument, meaning pass or fail if we were to tick on pass here as well. As opposed to checkboxes, which are a multi-select option, um, if we take a look at our inline comments here, we've got the option here to select our operator being or or and. So in this case, we've set our comment that if rainy and windy has been selected, we want a comment. But we can change this to or, meaning either one of those can be selected to display a comment. Our other conditional comment here is on number fields. So here we've got a number field has been added to the system already, and we've uh, made our comment conditional. And in this case, we can start applying a little bit of uh, basic mathematical logic here. So for our number, we can choose our operation being equal to uh, being less than, um, being not equal to, sorry, being less than, greater than. In this case, we've selected less than or equal, so we want it to be four or less, or we can also select four or more. In this case, we'll leave the value here as, um, as four. Um, so we'll also take a very brief look at our um, approval workflows as well that we saw before. So with our approval workflows here, they're using our approval form question. When we add an approval element onto the screen, we can um, determine as part of the form design whether we want any user to approve, meaning that someone will need to select the approver at the time the form record is being created. Um, or we can also specify the approver as we've done in the second example here, where we want the same approver um, to be, or where we want it, sorry, to be going to the same approver each time. Um, there is uh, permission sets that can be applied for managers and administrators as well that allows them to override approval, meaning that whoever the approver is, if they've got that permission, they can be, they can take over the approval as well. For cases where you have a more complex approval workflow or else an approval workflow that uh, changes depending on organisational structure or feedback within the form, such as um, approval from a plant manager only when a particular safety critical part of an asset checklist has been failed, uh, we can use our conditional display functionality to show or hide the, uh, the correct um, the correct fields based on that response. So in this case here, we're showing our line manager field for both divisions A and B for that division question, but then we're only showing the division A or division B questions based on that response.
Now, as we're going through our form design, as we uh, set up all of our form, uh, all of our form ideas here, it's always a good habit to get into to click on save and just keep saving as you go. We've We've all made that mistake in the past where we have gone through and spent several hours doing a form, forgotten to save it, and then um, the system has logged us out at the last minute. Um, so it's always a good habit to get into. Now, the way that uh, form versioning works, saving will just save your current draft of the form, but it won't make it available to your users to complete until you hit publish. So you can absolutely keep saving many times um, without it impacting your users who are currently using an old version of the form. When you're ready for that, um, when you're ready for that pushed out, you can click on publish for that um, for that change to be pushed out to everybody's uh, user accounts to be made available. Depending on uh, people's uh, synchronization on their phones, depending on Wi-Fi connectivity or um, whether they're online or offline with the mobile app, it may take up to a few hours for forms to be pushed out to the mobile app. Um, but users, if they do need the latest version of the phone immediately, uh, of the form, sorry, immediately, can force synchronize their app. So the round arrow in their mobile app will allow them to get the latest version of the app um, before their phone decides to synchronize. Um, Rightio. And so the last thing I just want to briefly uh, share with you here is where you can control uh, your access for your forms. Now, we won't go into too much detail on, or any detail, in fact, on permissions themselves, but each of your forms, if we look at it back at our forms, form our records list, we have here what we call form groups. Now, these are driven by your in-house administrators, and these are managed from the settings tab. Now, it's these form groups that help control that access to the forms. Uh, so in a lot of cases, we've seen clients who will build our form groups based on projects, based on uh, roles or business functions, or even based on organisational structures. There's no right or wrong answer with how to file your forms. Um, it's a case of what works best for your business. Uh, so I'll hand back over to uh, Maddie. I think we might have a few questions. We do. Thanks, Dan. That was really good. So we've just had a couple of little questions come through. Um, one of the first ones being around um, approvals, like notifications of the order um, for approvals. So, um, you know, with the approval email, will that be sent to both approvers at the same time or are they usually sort of set, um, you know, depending on the workflow? Uh, that's a great question, Maddie. So the notifications, will actually go out as um, each time responsibility for the form changes itself. So uh, the first approver will get a notification to let them know they've been assigned this form to review. And the next approver won't be notified until there is actually something for them to do, meaning the first approver has already approved, completed any other mandatory questions and the form has been sent on to approver number two. Wonderful. And then someone else has just asked in here, um, are you able to cover off a little bit of information around our public forms? Absolutely. So public forms are a way to um, make your form records accessible without logging into the system. They are designed largely for um, things like permits or if you think about, say, a contact us now form available on many websites. So setting up a public form, uh, to do that, we're going to click across into our form admin screen and we're going to select our form. And in fact, I've act I actually created one a little while ago. So in this example, we're going to look at our new employee onboarding personal details. So I'm going to go into the admin view. Now, this is already set up as a public form. Uh, if anyone would like to have a try of this, you're welcome to scan the QR code on the screen with your mobile device and that'll take you directly to the public form. But in our example, we're just going to click on our public form link as well, and we'll be able to um, we'll be able to take a look at that public view. Now, because the form is a public form, meaning our um, people completing it aren't logging into the system, they're not uh, probably in most cases they're not going to know where to file the form to within the organisational structure. All of that information is hidden. All they're going to see here is a very basic form to fill out. From there, these forms are then uh, pushed straight back into the system. And in this case, uh, for this particular form, uh, this form is sitting uh, within the people and culture team. And so it's being uh, popped into the system here with all of the details from that uh, submission from the public. 
That's awesome. Thank you, Dan. Really appreciate that. Um, now, I've just got a couple of other little questions in here. Um, I have a question just about reporting that came through on Q&A. How do I get reports to my executives on time and the easiest way possible to do it? Like, is there a schedule and certain, you know, people maybe have different requirements? Um, great question. So there is a uh, what we call a schedule reporting function within Lucidity. We will uh, we'll share a direct link to the vi uh, video explaining that full process after the meeting. Um, but in summary, you are able to set up a set of um, saved filters. So what are the criteria you want the form record to satisfy? And then what we always suggest is come along to the uh, form specific list. So in this case, the new employee onboarding and personal details and set up your filter and your schedule report from here. Uh, best practice is if the form is, or the schedule report, sorry, is being set up to go to multiple people or else someone aside from yourself, um, log into a generic user account. We usually recommend the report emailing administrator user account. And that way, any of those scheduled reports that have been authored in the past won't stop working if that uh, report author leaves the business and their user account is disabled. Thank you. And then um... we've just had uh, there's a couple of uh, sort of related questions coming in, just following on from the approval, um, the approval process, but also around completion of the forms. Um, so uh, Divya just uh, has asked that if the approver is specified, the notification goes out immediately as soon as a form is saved, whether the fields are completed or not. And I think this also relates to a question someone else asked around. Um, the uh, whether there could be a save or submit functionality added. And I think generally this this probably relates to the fact that when a when a form is saved that has all mandatory fields completed, the form is marked as complete in Lucidity. We consider that form as as finished, um, and that's what a lot of the notifications are connected to. So when a when a form is defined as complete, that then triggers all of these workflows such as that, you know, potentially the respondent shifting over or notifications going through. Um, but uh, there is an in progress stage of a form where um, you can save periodically and it doesn't do things like send out notifications based on form completion. So the way that the way you sort of manage that in the, in the system is by ensuring that all of the mandatory fields are the things that you consider sort of the form being completed that then kicks off those those other notifications if there are other questions in there that you need complete before say the the form sends out an email notification best practice would be to add sort of a final step um, in the form that is maybe a question that's just a checkbox something like ready to submit or this form is finished making that mandatory that way and i think there was actually one in the example dan went through that way the last question in the form is always mandatory and always prevents the form going to that completed status until the user ticks that box to kick off those workflows um, so i just thought i'd yeah sort of bundle a couple of questions together there thanks alex Yep. So I've, what I've done here, Alex, I've just on the um, on the screen share, we've just uh, demonstrated what that would look like in um, uh, within a form here. So we've now put in a mandatory question directly before the people and culture team approval element, meaning that the form won't get sent to people and culture until there is a response in this question. In this case, ticking yes. That's wonderful. Um, now, and I don't know if Alex, you kind of covered that off. There was just a um, response here um, in regards to public enabled forms, um, having issues that some of the divisions are not seeing the completed forms due to not having the scope to see them as an org structure. Um, do we have any advice around how to address that one? Um, great question. So, at the moment, the best advice here is to um, have somebody who is able to see all forms across across the organisation because those um, public forms are being submitted without an organisational selected, uh, and they are able to then uh, update that after that form has been 
submitted so those divisions can can see it. Now there is a um, there is a piece of work our product team are currently looking at that is on the roadmap to be able to encode organisational hierarchies into public forms. It's not yet enabled, but it is something that we are investigating um, as a possible feature. That also ties into a question Robert asked about. Um, does uh, does the asset and usage functionality work on public forms? Which we have we have disabled that from public forms, really, because you know, public forms can be submitted by anybody. There's no authentication required, so we don't really want to be exposing your asset register and also allowing um, unauthorized users to make changes to the usage values in the uh, in the asset module. So those those pieces of functionality aren't available on those public forms. Um, some more questions flowing in, but we are coming close up to time. We want to make sure that we stick to um, stick to the time we've uh, we've allocated in everyone's calendars, and we're going to take a break for lunch. Um, so, what we might do keep uh, keep posting any questions in here. Um, we will uh, we'll make sure that we sort of either come back to you individually, or if it's something that um, sort of has has that broader. Um, uh, broader interests, we can include it in sort of the follow-up email that'll go out after this session. Um, but we will uh, we will wrap up here. Um, just want to thank everyone for joining um, to this uh, this first uh, first session. I can see from some of the chat we uh, we maybe need to figure out a bit about how Teams passes volume through over the uh, over the connection. It was uh, it was sounding fine for me, but there are definitely a couple of people having issues. Hope uh, no one was deafened when uh, when we came back on uh, on live. If you'd turned your volume all the way up, um, but uh, yeah, th thanks for joining. Thanks uh, thanks Dan for for taking us through. Um, like I said, if you uh, if you raise a question we haven't got around to, we'll uh, we'll include that in the follow up, um, and we'll also make sure to send the recording of today out to everyone who registered, um, whether you uh, whether you did attend or, or weren't able to. That way, you can share it around the business to see if anybody um, anyone else is interested in in watching. Um, We'll also send through a bit of a feedback survey. Um, this is the first one that we've we've run of these in a while. We'd love to hear your feedback. What uh, what worked? What uh, what did you like to see? What would you have liked to see more of? But also any other topics that we could cover in in future videos. I saw a couple of questions relating to incident, um, not really in the scope of, of this session, but that's definitely a, a good one for a future video. So even outside of things like uh, like inform any other modules in the platform it'd be great to hear any sort of suggestions there um thanks again to everyone um and uh, have a great afternoon and, and rest of the week we'll speak to you soon